Greetings, everyone, and welcome to podcast 18 of Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. And we're going to move right on into the reading. I love going where I'm celebrated, not just tolerated. The song is an uplifting message of victory, blending American R&B, pop with Soweto spiritual singers, chants, and African musical influences. I watched videotapes of the singers listened to them, and just fell in love with their music instantly. The song would not be incomplete without a touch of gospel. Part of the rules for the World Cup anthem was the song include a performance by an African artist or group. As this was a massive global event that would shine the spotlight of the world on Africa, they wanted to make sure that local African talent got some of the glow as well. I reached out to my label in South Africa and asked them if they could help me find a a choir to sing on the track. They introduced me to a South African gospel choir, the Soweto Spiritual Singers. After watching how performance footage and listening to their music was so perfect, the song would not be complete without their unique gospel touch. So I arranged to record it with the choir. The percussion beats combined with the chorus of a heavenly um, African voice gave the song stamp of authenticity. I was humbled when the co-founder of the Soweto Spiritual Singers described our effort. The song embodies the story of South Africa, hope, strength, and triumph over adversity. It is an uplifting message of victory. It blends American R&B with spiritual singers, Zulu chants, and African musical influences. Although Sign of a Victory was custom made for the event, we had to wait several weeks before we found out if the song would even be accepted for the official album. I was blown away when I learned it was selected as the official anthem for the 2010 World Cup Games. It would also be the first track on Listen Up. The official 2010 album. I felt like instead of dominoes falling down, things were starting to go the other way. It was dominoes up and sign of a victory was the first domino to stand. The opening ceremonies for the World Cup were scheduled for June 11, 2010 at the newly built Soccer City Stadium in Johannesburg. Artists from the album, along with more than 1,500 other artists, dancers, singers, praise poets, drummers, and flag bearers, were invited to perform at the opening ceremony. I was to have the honor of performing the official anthem and was excited about my second trip to Africa and the opportunity to get another taste of the unconditional love I had experienced a year earlier. I wasn't sure who'd be there to greet me when my plane touched down. My hopes were high, but I just didn't know if my African fans cared enough to come greet me at the airport. Well, they showed up by the thousands. N- newspaper accounts put the number at 10,000. Getting off the plane and seeing the sea of beautiful black faces looked biblical to me. I was in tears. I drove into the crowd so my spirit would go out to the people. When I finally made it to the car, I jumped off the roof so, or I jumped on the roof so my fans could see me as I pumped my fist in the air. I love going where I'm celebrated, not just tolerated. The day before the World Cup opening, I attended a fest in Cape Town with the executive mayor, Dan Plato, to take part in a special celebration for Nelson Mandela. During the Grand Parade World Cup welcoming ceremony, I stood beside Plato. When he stepped out onto the balcony of Cape Town City Hall above tens of thousands of fans, this was the same balcony from which Mr. Mandela made his first speech upon his release from prison in 1990. We were there to light the cauldron that symbolized that the everlasting light provided by Mandela's legacy. I felt very honored to be the first to light the eternal flame with the mayor. Once the cauldron was lit um, with arms outstretched and with that beautiful lyrical African accent, Plato shouted, can you feel it? (laughs) The crowd cheered wildly After the lighting of the eternal flame, we went to the stage area where I had to be, where I had been asked to sing, I Believe I Can Fly. 
Now I really didn't have an opening song planned for the occasion, but the mayor's words, can you feel it, kept repeating in my head. The Suedo singers went on before me, and they were singing a wonderful chorus with an incredible addictive beat. The air was filled with the sound of volvazelas, an African horn, almost like a supersized kazoo that gives off a piercing, majestic sound, say, annoying. The sound of the vez velous became the soundtrack for the entire trip as it is used for celebrations, sporting events, any kind of occasion where people are expressing joy or excitement. From backstage, I asked that the choir continue to sing out the rhythm when I took the stage. They did. I walked out singing, Can You Feel It? And again, the crowd went wild. I quickly slid into I Believe I Can Fly and a place that erupted. It was truly humbling to see all these people from the very young to the very old on a continent so far from Chicago singing my song and they knew every single word. While I was singing Fly, in the back of my head, the lyrics for Can You Feel It were forming. I was on stage singing one song while mentally scribbling another. I told one of our camera crew to make sure that he got the opening of my performance so that I could have the recording for reference. I promised myself that I'd complete the song once I got home, and I did. More than 85,000 fans were screaming, waving, and blowing the Vavuzula when I arrived at Soccer Stadium for the opening ceremonies of the World Cup. It seemed like everyone was in accord, showing great love. There were soccer fans from all over the world, each representing their country and their favorite team. Especially excited were the South African fans rooting for the national team, Bafana Bafana, who were competing in this first match against Mexico. Nelson Mandela himself would be in the crowd, and Joanne Kelly's son would soon be performing Sign of a Victory with this great man in the audience. The energy of the crowd shot in me like electricity. There's just no other way to describe it. The crowds, all of that love, all of that energy, the very spirit of Africa electrified my senses all at once. As I was on my way to the dressing room beneath the stadium where I was um, to change away from my cue in the ceremony, a few people from the group I had been traveling with came running towards me. Somehow I could read their spirit. They were bringing bad news, which I did not want to hear, especially before my performance. I tried to get them to restrain themselves and hold off on whatever it was they had to tell me until later, but the news couldn't wait. Zanani had been killed in a car accident. They said that Zanani is gone. The words went through my heart like a bullet, but there was nothing I could do but go on the field. When the crowd saw me, the screaming and the vefuzelas went crazy. The sound was like a gigantic swarm of bees. Dressed in all black, but for a gold hood and sneakers, backed by a powerful Soweto singers, I began the performance in a crouched position. I stood and sang the powerful rendition of Sign of the Victory that I could muster. I sang for Zanani and her great-grandfather. I sang for all the grandfathers and grandmothers, all the fathers and mother, mothers, all the brothers and sisters who had lost someone they had loved. I sang to 85,000 people in the stadium that day and the 2 billion people watching around the world. I sang for love itself. Wow. Hands across the world. I came back from Africa with a deeper understanding of myself and a strong desire to do even more with my music. What dwells within me is global, and my music speaks all languages. I became obsessed with the idea of world peace and accomplishing it through the brotherhood of music. Music will pave the way. This was the motivation behind Epic, an album of some of my inspirational records. The world's greatest, if I could turn back the hands of time, I'm your angel and I believe I can fly. It also included five new ballads. Among them came, Can You Feel It? The song I'd heard in my head while performing in Cape Cod. In a sign of victory, I decided to include a couple of songs from the African album in this collection as well. The prelude, Heal It, and the song Victory both fit perfectly with this album's inspirational theme. Fireworks was another song inspired by the World Cup. 
I wrote and recorded it the day I got the news about Sign of Victory being chosen as the official anthem. In my mind, I could truly see the fireworks of ceremony. My joy is recorded in that song. I believe I was inspired by the election of Barack Obama as President of the United States. The song came to me when he was still running in office. Usually, when I write inspirational songs, I see myself as a hero trying to save people with the music. With the 1A artist, everything was real. I love having fun with my music. I also love working with great people, different people, different genres of music, and the different talents and gifts. It helps stretch my talents and ability. I will forever... I will be forever humbled by the soul-to-soul connections with members of my African family. I consider my continuing African experience among the highest highs of my solar coaster. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Miss McClinn. Thank you, God. I want my song to go beyond what I wrote it for and perhaps touch people all around the world and inspire. It's extra special doing it here in South Africa, more special than anywhere else, he said, because I believe that humanity, the spirit of people, and the DNA all started right here in Africa. Love Letter. With my time machine, I can stay rooted in the music that made me while creating songs based on current experiences and inspiration. It felt like Knowing that people could depend on you to come up with songs that make them want to make love, to get on the dance floor, or to be better fathers, mothers, men, and women. But with all the fame, fortune, and media attention, I'm also struck with the thought that this is an awesome responsibility. This is why it's important for artists to tap into the spirit of music. Every now and then, it's important to tap into the spirit of the greats so we can extend their legacies. Hopefully, you know someone. That's what this whole thing is about. It's the power of music. Generation after generation, music is God's miracle channeled through his children who express his gifts. Our job is to just keep the miracle of music alive express it the best to our ability and pass it on to those who follow. My legacy is important to me. After I'm gone, I want to be remembered for the music and the way my music touched people around the world. I want to be remembered as a songwriter, a singer, a performer, a producer, and a good father. And honestly, I want to be remembered as one of the most versatile artists of my era. All this was on my mind when I decided to produce my next album, Love Letter. I, it had gotten to the point where every time I switched on the radio, I'd hear my sounds and my riffs. I was flattered, but also concerned. This new generation, I'm familiar with my original work, might think I'm copying what they hear on the radio when in reality, I'm just doing me. I didn't want Love Letter to go to the future because I didn't want to get ahead of myself. And I didn't want to stay where I was at, look to the side and see another version of my current self. Instead, I got into the musical time machine and set the dials to 20, 30, 40 years. I land, when I landed, I found myself hanging out with Sam Cooke, Jackie Wilson, spiritually and musically. I shook hands with them, soaked in their essence. They became my teachers, fathers, uncles, big brothers. I put myself in their time zone. And when I returned to the present, I brought armfuls of gifts and exciting goodies. I decided that the love letter was to be a con- concept album an entire CD unified by the theme of love. I love doing concept albums more than any other kind of album. They allow me to, in a way, get dressed up musically. It's not a freestyle situation. I set boundaries for myself and the music must stay within those lanes. Love has never failed. It has won every battle. Today and forever, love will go undefeated. With love letter, Every song had to be about love, old-fashioned, L-O-V-E. So I programmed myself musically to come up with love-feeling tracks, songs both romantic and sexy, yet classy, like back in the day. I had to set the proper mood in my studio. On my big screen TV, I projected pictures of guys like Ray Charles and Marvin Gaye. I wanted to see their faces. I wanted them with me as I wrote songs, practiced lyrics, and laid down tracks. I knew these men, like all men, had their struggles. They went through trials and tribulations, but through it all, they had a heart for music and a love for people. That love shined through every song they sang. 
I have that same heart for music, that same love for people, but I didn't want to be R. Kelly or Kells or the Pied Piper or R&B or the Weatherman. I wanted you to feel the mama's boy inside of me. I wanted you to feel Robert. I wanted the sweetest part of my soul to touch the sweetest part of yours. I saw the album as an actual body of songs, one arm, then another arm, a head, a leg, another leg, a foot, another foot, a nose, a smile, two smiling eyes, not just a collection of individual songs. I conceived Love Letter as one love single, a letter filled with heart, tears, and passion on each page. I hadn't originally planned for Love Letter to be my next album, as I often do. I was working on material for two albums at the same time, Love Letter and the project that I would be doing up next was Zodiac, a, con a continuation of 12 Play Concept. I'd even come up with a new name for myself for the album, January Boy, because I'm a Capricorn. But then a song so powerful came to me in the studio that it took over there um, could be no question that it was going to be the next record. When a Woman Loves was the first single, just that a righteous woman is a backbone of a man, a woman's trust, love, true love can be the backbone of an album. After all, a woman's love, actually two women's, Joanne Kelly and Lena McClin, made me who I am. In Love Letter, I'm singing about the love that comes from a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother. I'm singing about the love that comes from your fiance, your wife, your daughter, your granddaughter. It's the kind of love that keeps on going and growing. I don't even consider when a woman loves a song, really. It's like a heart that keeps the body alive. Singing it was challenging because it was written in the mode of Jackie Wilson. Like so many of the great artists back then, Jackie had a powerful voice. He belted out every note. He cried out every lyric. There was no half-stepping. Sam Cooke was my spiritual soulmate. As I wrote, drop down on your knees, please for a woman's affection. I love that style and believe it's what what's missing in songs heard on the radio today. Love Letter brings those powerful styles and that heart and soul connection back into the mainstream classic love letter is a gorgeous 15 track ode to the variety to the various stages of love drawing from a retro soul sound and delivered with romantic grace N nakisa moody associated press domino sometimes i feel like an alien born on a planet called music where there's nothing but sound Sometimes even in the midst of thousands, I still feel alone because no one, including me, understands my mind, my creativity, how I am hardwired. I've been very honest about my inability to read words like normal people. I simply don't see words. I see music. I'm okay with that. It's part of the gift. I am so grateful that my incredible children have not been afflicted with my problem. They can all read and write better than their father. I am so very proud of them. When asked if I considered myself a genius, I said, no, I can't call myself a genius, but I'm on my way. I feel like I haven't been fully introduced to my gift. I always feel like there's something bigger and better out there for me. It's like I'm stuck on a runway waiting for the best flight ever. In countless interviews, people ask me, if you could go back and change anything in your life, what would it be? My answer, not a damn thing. I wouldn't change the poverty. I wouldn't change the abuse or the pain. Even though I've had some struggles and downfalls in my life, I'm still standing strong, confident, and feeling good about life and love. I have no regrets whatsoever simply because whatever I've gone through has made me the man and artist I am today. Chapters in my life continue to unfold, revealing mysteries I never knew about myself. Just as I was finishing this book, the strangest thing happened. One late juicy Tuesday night in Chicago, I had just finished hooping and was feeling pretty good. My team had won about 20 games in a row. I noticed two middle-aged, neatly dressed women I've never seen before approaching the court. I was recovering from emergency surgery to remove an abscess the size of a golf ball on my throat, a situation that had it, it gotten untreated for another 24 hours could have destroyed my voice forever or even killed me. 
The woman had read about my hospitalization in the papers and drove four hours just to check on me. The plot thickens. The woman, whom I had never seen before in my life, claimed to be my aunts, sisters of my father. I had never known and was told had abandoned me and my mother when I was born. When the woman had a different version of the story, my father, they said, was present at my birth. He dearly loved my mother and me, and they said he died when I was two years old, shot to death in a bar. Is any of this true? I have no idea, but I have to find out. It's another piece of my puzzle that is me, another trapped in the closet cliffhanger, another twist and turn on the solar coaster that is my life. As I write this, I've begun yet another chapter in my life. I've come out of my suburban cocoon, moving out of Olympia Fields home and up into a deluxe apartment in the sky. Every night I gaze down on Chicago, the beautiful city that raised and fed me and the sky skyscrapers that helped me hit some of the highest notes. The chocolate factory is no longer in my basement. It's bigger and better than ever and still my sanctuary. The chocolate factory keeps operating at full capacity. The R. Kelly 4.5 part of me feels like I'm just starting out, like I'm just still on the runway of my career getting ready for takeoff. As always, I'm working on more than one project. I was thrilled to be asked to write new, uh, new songs for the remake of the movie Sparkle and have my song stand next to Curtis Mayfield's classic, Write Me Back. The follow-up of Love Letter will be out by the time you read this. It's me stepping back into my musical time machine and having a ball. I got to imagining that I was Barry White or, Ter or Teddy Pendergrass or Ray Charles. There's some Smokey and Stevie in there too. As the, as the radio in my head keeps playing and sending me songs and genres, not just R&B, but pop, rock, and even country. Don't be surprised if I get inspired to put out a country music album someday. The alien that is trapped in the closet is getting ready to visit Earth again. I know everyone wants to know what the package is. Get ready. You're about to find out. There are artists of all kinds knocking at my door, looking for new songs, asking me to drop a verse on their songs or looking for remixes. I'm grateful that they've come to me and are giving me the opportunity to share their gifts. Ideas are lined up on the runway in my head like airplanes at O'Hara. The minute one takes off, another is ready to go. There is still so much I want to achieve. Movies that I write and direct and of course do all the music. A one-way Broadway show, a music. Africa is calling me. So is Europe. I love London and Paris. They're telling me Tokyo loved the love letter to heart and wants me to sing it to them personally. I can't wait to get out there. I feel that the same, I feel the same way about China and Russia and every other part of the world. The world needs healing and music is the medicine that heals. I'm still amazed that healing music can came my way in such quantities. I don't know why I received this gift. I can't say I deserve it. I know that I'm not immortal, but my gift is my legacy. Sometimes my gift is my enemy. My head is like an overinflated balloon filled with sounds that swell my brain to the extent that I fear it might explode. When it does explode, I find myself in a new and beautiful musical place. It's taken me a time to know myself, but I think I'm almost there. I'm at my best when I'm most wanted. And I know the music lovers still want great music. I know that as long as people are living on this planet, as long as they can relate to a real song about real life, I'll always be in the game. So it is as a happy man that I come to the beginning of this book. No, I did not say the end. As far as I'm concerned, the solar coaster is just getting warmed up. It's been a crazy ride up, but I know the best years are still ahead. I give thanks to the creator for my life every day. I could have gone either way. That bullet I took while riding that bicycle as a kid could have been the end. Shame and disconnection because I couldn't read could have been my dead end. I have achieved what I have in this life because I was blessed with a gift and a love to, of two exceptional women who saw something in me that I did not, could not see in myself. I have been knocked to my knees. I have been betrayed and maligned. I had lost love and thrown it away. My heart was, has been broken and I have cried an ocean of tears. In the end, though, 
I am saved by music. I am saved by God. I am saved by God's gift of love. And if through my music and words, I can pass on that gift to you, I am the happiest man on earth. As a boy born in Chicago's hood to a loving mother has been blessed mightily. The boy became a man. The man faced a mountain of struggles, but the struggles steeled his determination. For all the storms behind him, the sun seems to always break through. There are sunrises ahead and still thousands of songs to write and sing. Songs that help us have fun and party all night. That leave us undying joy of love. That lifts our burdens and give us a little taste of heaven. For harmony, peace, and humanity. The solar coaster soars to the top. The solar coaster roars to the bottom. But the boy holds on. The man holds on. He can't and won't let it go. Even though I have had some struggles and downfalls in my music and in my life, I'm still standing strong, confident, and feeling good about my life and love. I have no regrets whatsoever simply because whatever I've gone through has made me a man and an artist I am today. And that is the end of Solar Coaster, A Diary of Me by R. Kelly. And I just want to say... I give honor to the reading of this precious historical piece of music that was formed into words. And it's amazing how, even though he could not read or write, a book of this magnitude was created. So he was moving into the greatness of even more than what he even knew he had within him. Um, and it's just so super happy. I'm, I'm, I'm just so excited. And I thank you for going on this journey with me. When I first opened the book, it said, whatever you do, hold on. And that's exactly what we had to do through that whole 400 page book. I think 487, 387. And, and it's so amazing how R. Kelly is such a humble Man, he is so beautiful. And um, someone called me or texted me on, on Facebook and claiming to be Robert Sylvester. And uh, he gave me a social security, he gave me a, a snippet, a picture of a social security number. And he said he had this in his phone from back in the past. And he wanted to know why I was doing all this for him. And I told him I would hit him up, you know, at the correctional institution, not knowing that we've already made our connection. So I played that um, disgruntled individual who's trying to, you know, imposter um, the beautiful Robert Sylvester Kelly. But you can't do that. You know, the real and the original will always show face. But during this collaboration with this individual it was such a soft energy of exchange of words and peace and tranquility to until towards the end when he says in this that it whatever we do stays between us and it's um and it's going to be my way or I'm not interested so I blocked him <laughs> I don't care who you are you're not going to disrespect me and this is what I'm trying to tell individuals women that you do not have to, you know, suffer any type of negative vibration in any way, shape or form. You do not have to stay where someone tells you to stay. You know, it's about empowering the mind and becoming our own energy, our own individualized self. Um, we look at Azriel Clary at this moment. We look at Jocelyn Savage and we see that they're still moving on with their lives no matter what has taken place, no matter what's going on. And, and you know, I mean, but they probably thought that being with R. Kelly was the best, best thing and nothing else would have made their lives any better. But now that they're not with him, again, just like R. Kelly said, he would never change anything because the lesson is the blessing. So I thank you so much for going on this journey with me. What are your thoughts? Please drop them in the comment box below. Let me know what you're feeling about the whole version of Solar Coaster. It's all on a playlist, um, 20 minute increments. If not, the most is 30, maybe 35 minutes. And wow, we made it through. We made it through this Solar Coaster project. And I have something for you special on Sunday. 
um, please join, like, comment, and subscribe to the R. Kelly Appeal TV on Sundays, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you will get the newest information, the truest information, because I just don't go based upon what everyone else is saying. I do my own research and it has to be thoroughly investigated before I, you will hear it come out of my mouth at all. So get with the real, get with the real one. And as always, keep it 100. We'll see you next time.